previously in the complete creation. As you can see, these trees are buried vertically, cutting through multiple layers of sediments. And some of you will immediately grasp the significance. If those rock layers equal millions of years as we are taught, you've got a real problem here. How on earth is a plant going to stick around for millions of years while it slowly gets buried? But it gets far more interesting. These are not actually trees. They are giant hollow reeds, predominantly plants called lycopods and calamites, both plants that are still around today. Welcome back, thanks for joining me and continuing on this rather grueling and exhaustive journey as we explore the evidence and philosophies behind the creation-evolution debate. In the last lecture, we started to look at the polystrate fossil phenomena, which we literally find all over the world. We started at what is probably the most famous of all the polystrate fossil sites, Joggins of Nova Scotia, Canada. We saw some of the reasons why these gigantic fossil plants are actually a challenge to the millions of years portrayed in education, media, and textbooks. In looking at the history of Lyell's visit to the cliffs and his interpretation of the fossil evidence within his new history of deep time, we saw that he tried to portray the fossil stumps as plants that were buried in situ, buried where they grew. I mentioned 10 reasons that geologist Harold Coffin compiled, which were affirmed and added to by the further research of Australian geologist John Mackay and myself over many combined decades. Some of the reasons we know that those fossil stumps were not buried where they grew, the negative geotropism we talked about, in the last lecture. The roots were evidently buoyed up in a mud slurry, not growing downward into the ground like growing roots would, but instead buoyed up. The roots on the polystrate plants are often truncated, broken off. Sometimes the rootlets have been stripped from the roots or the roots and rootlets have been stripped from the stumps. Some of the stumps, even ones with intact roots and rootlet, are buried upside down in the rock layers. Now, if these were forests that were buried, where are the mature fossil or the mature forest soils from the forest? Everyone agrees there are no mature soils preserved in the fossil form or in evidence in any of the layers at Joggins. I was discussing a discovery from the Pennsylvanian coal mines by Gastaldo, a polystrate calamites plant that had allegedly regrown some roots at different levels after being buried multiple times indicating time. I also pointed out how it appeared to actually not be a plant growing in place, but it appeared to have been a mistake and the plant was actually buried upside down in catastrophic flood conditions. Now, as I was making this point in the last program, I was so rudely interrupted by the clock. So I'd like to pick up where I left off. This fossil plant, buried upright with alleged roots at different levels, appears to have been misinterpreted. These are not roots, but whorls of branches, exactly like what we would expect to see based on modern plants. But 
the branches appeared to descend into the sedimentary layers because the plant was actually buried upside down. Myself and several others have documented finding polystrate plants buried upside down in the fossil record. So this is not unprecedented by any means. In the next few lectures, I'll give you plenty more examples of upside down polystrate fossils from around the world. So, however, let us give Gastaldo this argument. Let's say that this highly questionable interpretation is actually correct. And this actually is a polystrate plant showing evidence that it grew new sets of roots at different levels after multiple in-situ burials over time. Excellent! As ben, has been acknowledged by Gastaldo himself and everybody else, <laughs> this is the only example in the entire world of a fossil polystrate plant with roots regenerating at different levels. Now, I have personally studied and examined hundreds, perhaps thousands, of polystrate fossils all over North America. So just how many have the secular paleontologists like Gastaldo studied? How many have creation geologists like Harold Coffin and John Mackay studied? All of that combined knowledge and the whole world can only come up with one example of what is claimed to be roots regenerating at different levels? Contrary, to what the desperate writers of Wikipedia try to portray, this does not support the in-situ burial theory at all. It only brings up the question, uh, where are all the other plants that should have also regenerated roots if these millions of polystrate fossil plants we find all over the world truly were buried in situ? So, even if Gastaldo's highly questionable interpretation is correct, and I see plenty of reasons to conclude it is incorrect, this is actually profound evidence that all of these polystrate fossils we find all over the world were laid down rapidly in one global catastrophic watery event. As I mentioned in the previous lecture, Sir William Dawson while studying the rocks and fossils of Joggins with Lyell, discovered some fossil lizards buried in the bottom of some of the hollow fossil stumps. He even named the lizard after Charles Lyell. Now, Lyell contended that after the gigantic reeds had been buried up to a certain depth, the trunk broke off level with the new ground level leaving a hole in the ground formed by the hollow stump. Lizards would fall into the stumps, die and become buried and preserved in fossil form inside the stumps. Now, a great story, but again, take a close look at the stumps when you're there. You'll notice that the pressure of the surrounding muds have compressed the stumps and actually fractured the trunks, splitting the sides and forcing mud into the trunks. As a matter of fact, remember these splits. I'm going to come back to that repeatedly as they hold significant clues to major geological events that happened here. The point for the moment, however, is that the trunks are split and compressed inward where the mud forced its way into the hollow stumps. So there are multiple possibilities as to how the lizards could have wound up in the bottom of these stumps. Like, sure, Lyell could have been right. The trunks broke off at ground level and a lizard fell into the hollow stump. But because of the dozen or so reasons compiled, we can safely conclude that the stumps in question were not buried in situ. So that rules out Lyell's hypothesis. The lizards could have been forced into the trunks along with the mud through the splits in the sides of the trunks. 
or the stumps ripped up from where they grew by the force of a flash flood were floating in the floodwaters. And the lizards climbed into the stumps to escape certain death. However, with the roots of the stumps being less buoyant than the rest of the stump, because the roots were specifically designed to absorb water, the stumps could reorient roots down, thus trapping the lizards in the stumps, even as the stumps themselves grounded during the ebb of the tidal waves. The stumps and lizards were quickly buried by massive amounts of mud being brought in by the next tidal waves of the global floodwaters. So lizards in the bottom of the stumps does not necessitate in situ burial of the stumps. However, even though the stumps are found polystrate through sometimes tens of feet of strata, even conventional geologists would claim that these stumps were buried by flash floods. There was a flash flood that would bury a layer of stumps. The flood would bury a forest where it grew. Then, some time later, some time would pass that another event and another flash flood would bury more of these stumps. So these conventional geologists, of course, would claim that in the passing time, new forests would grow. We've seen the multiple reasons why that's just not true. The stumps are not buried where they grew. But there's a further very important point here that uh, compresses the time frame involved in laying down all 20,000 vertical feet of sediments at the Joggins location. You see, the roots of the lycopods are hollow as well, just like the trunks. Yet the pressure of the mud bearing down on the roots has crushed them to the point where they failed and collapsed. So the roots were woody, hollow tubes uh, surrounded by dirt, just like culverts under the highway. So in this scenario, the tubes are incredibly strong even with a very thin wall. Yet, the weight of the mud piling on top of the roots got so high that the roots collapsed under pressure, splitting longitudinally on the top and the bottom. Now, I tried to simulate the pressures involved by making wooden tubes, burying them in soft sediments and compressing them. Now, my experimental equipment was not strong enough to even make the wooden tubes flinch. <laughs> the pressures involved here are enormous and would require hydraulic pressures. But we know that when the roots collapsed from overpressure, they had not yet rotted. The details preserved in the roots are incredible. No evidence of rot anywhere. The woody material of the roots, like the stumps and pretty much all of the other plant matter here, have now turned to coal. But coal is rigid and won't bend. It will shatter. So when the roots collapsed from overpressure, they had not yet turned to coal because they bent, collapsed, and split, filling with mud. They did not shatter into millions of tiny pieces. The pristine details of the roots and the cast of the roots and the surrounding stone all testify to this case. And that surrounding mud had not yet turned to stone because stone also will not bend under pressure. It will shatter. Yet the mud compressed right along with the roots during this compression event, preserving incredible details in the fossils, even filling, infilling in the hollow roots once they split from the overpressure. So from examining 
the fossils and geology, we can draw several conclusions. One, there is a compression event for each individual root. And I think it's safe to say that at Joggins alone, there was thousands of these fossil roots. Two, everyone agrees the compression was caused by lithostatic pressure from the accumulation of sediments piling up layer upon layer on top of the fossils. Three, the compression event occurred while the plant was still green. It had not yet rotted. It had not yet turned to coal and the surrounding sediments had not yet turned to stone as they were also still moldable and compressible. The surrounding sediments, mud, forced its way into the roots through the splits in the roots. However, I also previously mentioned that we find petrified trees in the strata of Joggins as well. We find these fossilized trees pretty much from the bottom of the strata right through to the top. But these solid wood tree trunks have also experienced a compression event of mind boggling pressures. Now here's a tree trunk. And it's interesting to note that when these fossil tree trunks are first exposed, they often have originally preserved woody material still present. Millions of years old? And there's still wood left? I don't think it's millions of years old. The majority of the wood core has now petrified or turned into stone while any of the bark still remaining and preserved has typically turned into coal. And so you sometimes see these fossil logs with all three states of preservation, original wood, petrified wood, and coalified wood. And by the way, remember this as we'll come back to this in a later lecture. This is certainly not the only place in the world you see this phenomenon. But take a look at this log. There's the cross section, there's the log. Remember, this is a log, a tree trunk, solid wood, yet it's been compressed by enormous pressures, squished down by about two to one. Do you realize just how much pressure that takes? I mean, take a two by four board and apply pressure to it until you start to squish it. Even better yet, take a log, bury it, and compress the dirt and log simultaneously until you squish that log to half its original thickness. The pressures involved are staggering. Now it takes around 400 PSI, 2.7 megapascals, just to put a dent in softwood. And all of the fossil trees at Joggins have experienced this compression from the bottom of the formation to the third of the top. Obviously, the tree trunk was still green during the compression event as the trunk was compressed. Its pristine nature shows no rot. The coalified parts clearly coalified after the compression event because the bark and now coalified parts flexed and showed no evidence of shattering or breaking like coal would do if it were flexed under pressure. The surrounding muds also had not yet hardened into rock. They were soft muds molding to and right along with the plant during the compression event. This compression is the norm in the fossil record. Take for example, Coelophysis here. Excavated from Ghost Ranch, you'll notice that this dinosaur is about the size of a dog, but it is no longer the thickness of a dog. It is the thickness of a dog that has been repeatedly run over by a transport. Obviously, the compression event that happened here happened before the flesh, or the flesh rotted off the dinosaur because there was something to compress. Otherwise, the mud would have just squished 
in between the bones with no real reason to compress the body like this. The compression event happened before the bones turned into fossils because they flexed under pressure and didn't shatter like a rock would. The mud was obviously still mud as it too molded and squished, not like a rock, which would shatter or not compress at all. So going back to Joggins, we have crushed and squished stigmarian roots and solid wood tree trunks from pretty much the bottom of the 20,000 feet of strata right to the top. So let's start with the plants buried at the bottom of the 20,000 foot thick stack. I mentioned it takes about, oh, 400 PSI just to dent softwood like pine. Well, obviously this tree trunk experienced a little more than uh, <clears throat> a dent. But let's go with that number for now. The sediments piling on top of it were probably about mm, twice the density of water. And so for simple yet ridiculously conservative math, let's go with a lithostatic pressure of one PSI per foot and say it only took 400 PSI to crush the trees and stigmarian roots. That 400 PSI is the ridiculous number here, by the way. I'm certain it took many magnitudes more pressure than that. So with our ridiculously conservative numbers, that means that some 400 feet of sediments had to have buried and were piled on top of the roots and trees so fast that the plants were still green and compressible. They had not yet had a chance to rot, the plants had not yet turned to coal, and the sediments burying them had not been compressed yet, nor had turned into rock. Quick question of the rhetorical kind. If you had seen a flash flood today that rapidly laid down 400 feet, 120 meters thick of sediments, enough to bury a 40-story building, would you say that was a long and slow geological process or would you call it a catastrophe? But if you go up in the stratigraphic sequence, long before you hit 400 feet up higher in the strata, you will encounter more squished and compressed logs and stigmarian roots, which were also crushed by a minimum of 400 feet of rapidly deposited sediments while they were still green, before they rotted, before they petrified or colified, and before the sediments had hardened into rock. So if you continue up the stratigraphic sequence long before you hit that minimum 400 feet of sediments, you will have encountered more squished fossils requiring rapid deposition of a minimum of 400 feet of sediments while the plants were still green, before they rotted, before they petrified or colified, and before the sediments had hardened into rock. You see where I'm going with this? You find these crushed fossils pretty much right through to the top of the 20,000 foot vertical feet of sediments. So in other words, some 20,000 foot thick of sediments were rapidly laid down by a massive flash flood burying innumerable plants and crushing them in such a short period of time that the plants were still green. They had not rotted. They had not petrified or colified. And the sediments had not yet turned to stone. Now, seeing as how water, heat, and pressure can turn plants into coal in hours in the lab, I think it's safe to say that at most, all 20,000 vertical feet of sediments here on the east coast of Canada was probably laid down within weeks. Not tens of years, not hundreds of years, not thousands of years, and certainly not millions of years. Such long time scales are frankly impossible because you would simply not see the effects that we see in the now fossil plants, and geology if it had happened over long periods of time. A couple of quick questions of the rhetorical kind. 
If you had seen a flash flood today that rapidly laid down some 20,000 feet, over 6,000 meters thick of sediments, would you say that was a long and slow geological process? Or would you call it a catastrophe? Would that be a local flood? Or a global scale flood? The present cannot be the key to the past. But in an upcoming lecture, we're going to take a look not just at the cliffs, but the top of the cliffs. And the massive erosion going on there today, which also show us the true scale of this watery global scale catastrophe that formed the fossil and geological record of the eastern seaboard. Coming up in the next Complete Creation. So, the fossil plants at Joggins aren't just polystrate, but exhibit consistent twisting of the roots, branches, and trunks, indicating that not only was all 20,000 vertical feet of sediments and fossils laid down over months at most, but when the entire geological formation was tilted to the south, that the fossil plants were deformed, twisted and bent out of shape during the continental division, which formed all the major mountain ranges at the same time. Obviously, there could not have been millions of years involved here. You can catch the entire series in a variety of ways. You can watch the show online at www.completecreation.org or www.genesisweek.com. You can also purchase the Complete Creation series in full high definition on Blu-ray or video on demand at completecreation.org. Or support the Miracle Channel with a monthly tax-deductible donation and access the entire Complete Creation series in high definition through Corco, Miracle Channel's video on demand service. We need your support to keep this program on the air. So please pray for us. And if you wish to financially support the program, Canadians can make a tax deductible donation to Core Ottawa, Canada North Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, K2K 2P4. Or you can make a donation via PayPal online at ianjuby.org forward slash donations. And thank you for your support.